education. Everyone has had something profound to say about the ability of education to transform lives. I think somebody, I don't know who, has said education is a key to success. Skills or our abilities to read and write are skills that those of us who have them take for granted. We don't often sit to ponder their potential life-saving value. I'm a Sentin resident. I have been a resident of this beautiful city since 1995. But those of us who know the history of this country will know that at age 44, being a black woman, I was not born in this city. Instead, I was born in Middle East Soweto. I'm number seven of my mother's eight children. We didn't have much growing up, but my mother imparted on my brothers and my one sister and I the value of education and its life-saving potential. I stand here as a proud graduate of two fine world-class institutions, one in the United States of America, pardon my accent, I actually have to say for the record, I am a Motswana girl who has lived, an ordinary Motswana girl at it. I am an ordinary Motswana girl who has lived an extraordinary life. The accent I got from television. <laughs> So, take it from me, education has the power to take an ordinary person like myself and bring us to the international stage. I want to now take you on my journey of how my education literally saved my life. And I want to invite you to listen and ponder whether or not you take your privileged access to education seriously. Many in this country can't read and write, but here goes my story. February, no, you see, I'm starting to lie to you even. <laughs> April 25, 2006 was an ordinary sunny day in this beautiful Josie of ours. Sent and mother that I was, I was fetching my beautiful daughter, who is my special guest here, from school. She was seven, three months into grade one. I had felt a lump on my br right breast during what was meant to be a decadent uh, scent and relaxing bath. But like many women do, I kept hoping that the lump will miraculously disappear. I did nothing about it. And please, my message is that I ask you not to start fiddling with your breasts. <laughs> I know that women, as soon as I'm going to tell you that I don't have breasts, you're all going to jump and start doing the self-breast exam or fiddling with your breasts. Leave them alone. That's not the message. <laughs> the message is I went, asked a locum who was working, I have a breast, please check it out for me. I don't have time, I'm a lawyer, time, time, time. We charge time, lawyers. Uh, so please do this, I have to fetch my child, go back and do all the legal uh, lawyer things. She did the breast self-exam and reassured me I'm black. I was 37 at the time. I had no family history of breast cancer and I had given birth. Lawyers and, and doctors and everybody else are taught to work on a tick shift. Yeah. <laughs> tick, tick, tick. And it didn't add up to the word that I didn't intend to say. And she reassured me that I was fine. I wasn't settled. I asked for more. She sent me for an ultrasound. The ultrasound came back. I was fine. Went to doctor number three. Doctor number three referred me to doctor number four. 
Everybody telling me, you're black, you're young, you've had babies, no family history, don't worry. But something in me was not settled. Cut a long story short, I ended up having something called a lumpectomy, which was something I insisted on. Lumpectomy is the surgical removal of a lump. When the lump that had been called a mobile-friendly lump came back, it wasn't mobile and friendly anymore. It was cancerous. I had used my education to advocate for myself. Do you use your education to claim your voice? Three weeks later, after my 37th birthday, I was a breathless woman in a world of cleavage. <laughs> my problems didn't end there. I had felt that my heart was beating faster than normal during my chemotherapy. And I asked my doctor once again, is this normal? And they said, there's an outside chance of developing cardiomyopathy as a result of drug damage. Well, I stand here. I'm one of the few ladies who have had their heart irrevocably damaged by chemotherapy. I stand here amidst the poverty of Africa. I stand before you because I'm able to purchase health and vigor. I stand before you because I can pay for life itself. I have a device in me where my African map is that is meant to monitor my heart and intervene if my heart moves too fast or too slow. Um, always at imminent risk of heart failure, but I'm here. I use my voice now to advocate on behalf of people who do not have the financial means like I do to purchase health and vigor. I use my voice to advocate for people who cannot afford to buy life itself. Cornelia Asante is not the name I was born with. I gave myself a new name after I saw the frightful bill for my heart device. <laughs> it was not funny at that time. 220,000 rand to save my life. In this country where disparities are so great. When I saw the bill, all I could say was, Kwanele Baba, Kwanele. My sister, who is Isizulu speaking, says it is enough. Yes, that is the literal meaning of the word, Kwanele. But in my sense, I used it in its gentler form to simply say, it is sufficient. The next words out of my mouth, I was crying, were Asante Sana. Asante Sana, I'm glad there are Africans in this village. <laughs> Asante Sana is Kiswahili for, not we love you, <laughs> for thank you very much. I went, Zuri Sana. Uh, I went to Home Affairs the next day to have my name legally changed. It took nine months to go through the process, which is a fantastic metaphor for life. <laughs> and my blessed healing name, hence my garb, that infused sense of African pride, my new clothing, my new name means that which you have blessed me with is sufficient. Why am I telling you this? You know, you're the first bunch of weird people that has paid to come see somebody talk about breast cancer. <laughs> I am telling you this because I want you to ponder the following question. 
before you is a simple formula. Voice equals choice equals life. Its application is not limited to what I do. If you're going to quote it, credit me. I failed math. This is the closest I ever came to, <laughs> to, to coming up with a formula. And for the record, this formula was made here. As in, I was living and dying down the street here, literally. The street that starts with F, that's where I was dying. Voice equals choice equals life. I ask you to ask yourself these questions. How do I, sitting there, use my voice to improve my life? How do I use my voice to improve the lives of those who live in poverty, face social injustice, live without in a country where there's a lot. I made choices for my treatment. I ask you to ask yourself, how do my choice as a person enhance my life? And how do my choices impact the lives of others? I invite you to ask yourself, do I take more from this world than I ought to? And what are the ramifications of that? It is bad to have cancer. It is worse to have cancer when you are poor. I ask you to very consciously to ask yourself, how am I now more consciously going to use my voice for social justice, to make a difference in the lives of those who have less? How am I going to use my voice sitting there and my access to education to advocate for a more just, equitable, and humane world? I say, Asante sana, Mze Nelson Mandela, for what you've given us. It is now up to us to move forward. Thank you.